The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 12192 in the name of Dennis Robertson on Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2015. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if members who wish to participate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on Dennis Robertson to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Mr Robertson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all uh, begin by thanking all those members that supported this motion in order for me to take forward the debate this evening? And can I welcome members to the gallery who are here from the diabetics with eating disorders and members who will be participating in an event this evening in Committee Room 4 after this debate? Presiding Officer, Prior to this debate, I asked myself, why? Why am I doing this? And the answer is really quite simple. We still need to continue raising the awareness for people with eating disorders within the uh, medical profession. It was once said to me, presiding officer, that things only change death by death. I'm actually hoping to take a much more positive view on this. I'm hoping things change by raising awareness, by awareness, by awareness. Presiding officer, this is the third time I've come to the chamber in raising the awareness. And I believe that in doing so, we have made significant changes. For instance, last year, we had the first ever eating disorder conference held in this parliament. It was well attended. We brought clinicians together with families, carers, patients, people from the media, colleges, universities, fashion industry, and all had one aim in mind, presiding officer, and that was to look at how best we serve those with eating disorders, how best we can make changes in their lives, how best we can resolve some of the problems that face those with eating disorders. Now, in the past, presiding officer, I have focused on anorexia for very personal reasons, and perhaps I can come back to that later. But I want to look at the whole spectrum. Well, maybe not the whole spectrum, but there is a wide spectrum of eating disorders. And those with bulimia nervosa have huge problems in coming to terms with their eating disorders. Quite often it goes undetected. And people secretly, yes, presiding officer, secretly cope with their condition. Thankfully, many more seek medical attention. But before they do that, quite often, um, much harm has been done to their body. It affects their fertility system. It can weaken their heart. It can damage their kidneys. It erodes the enamel from their teeth. Presiding officer, it is a dreadful eating disorder. There's non-specific eating disorders. And one of them perhaps is that related to those with diabetes. And presenting officer, I had no idea when I first came to this chamber or when I first became aware of eating disorders, I had no idea of those with diabetes and eating disorders. They are five times more prevalent in terms of the mortality than those with anorexia nervosa. A shocking statistic to me. And it would appear, presiding officer, that those with diabetes and eating disorders still don't have a recognised diagnosis. There's no medical name attached to this condition, as far as I'm aware. But hopefully in raising this awareness and bringing this to Parliament and having an event here and listening to the cl clinicians and having the minister attend, perhaps we will make some strides forward in listening to their story. Presiding officer, the chamber is well aware of my own story. And it's with sadness that I recall the fact that Caroline died four years ago. Four years ago tomorrow, in fact. And when this anniversary comes around, 
I do ask myself why. And I think I know the answer. It happened because it happened. It's as simple as that. It's not because there wasn't intervention. It's because there perhaps was the wrong intervention. It happened because maybe we were ill-informed as parents, as, as Caroline's main carers. But this is still too often the problem, presiding officer. Communication between the clinicians and the parents and the carers is still not at a level that we can have confidence in that the young person or those with eating disorders are getting the care and treatment that they need. NHS Grampian has had bad press recently, presiding officer. But let me give you a good story. A good story from NHS Grampian. They have probably an exemplary service for eating disorders at the moment. Exemplary, but with condition. They have a service that has a fantastic transition from the young person's eating disorder unit to adult services. Why? Because they learnt a lesson. They learnt a difficult lesson. They learnt a tragic lesson. But in saying that, they did learn a lesson. A lesson which needs to be replicated, I think, in other health boards throughout Scotland. And there are good practices. And the marzipan code of practice, presiding officer, should be picked up and implemented throughout the whole of the eating disorder services. Young people going to medical services are not being appropriately cared for. They're not getting the appropriate treatment when they go to hospital. Why? Because the, pe the people giving that treatment are not aware of the full implications of the eating disorder. Help is available, presiding officer. It just needs to be recognised. We have got better. I think the GP referral rate is better. I believe that psychiatric services are coming to terms with eating disorders. But resources are few. But let's look at the economic implication of eating disorders. It's estimated in the UK that somewhere between seven and eight billion pound is lost due to eating disorders. And that is the cost to the NHS or people in lack of employment or those requiring care. Presiding officer, I don't think those with eating disorders are asking for too much. But if I said the NHS Grampian service was an exemplar, it would be if they had the community services to support that of the hospital service. And with the integration of health and social care, can I say to the minister, let's look at the intensive therapy treatments that people require in the community with eating disorders. Let's take that step. Let's resource that necessary um, requirement for those, not just the patients and not just the carers, but for the clinicians to provide the treatment that those with eating disorders deserve and need. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes or so, please. And I call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Christian Allard. Uh, Presiding Officer, I welcome the opportunity to highlight for the third time in this parliamentary term this incredibly serious and, uh, issue and congratulate Dennis Robertson on his dedication uh, and on bringing forward this motion today. As many in this chamber will concur, he has been a brave voice in making this argument and we must all thank him for his resolute campaigning. Last year's Eating Disorder Conference, which uh, Dennis Robertson referred to, was a significant event which I was pleased to attend. It was significant not only for the academic community and experts, but for the many individuals and families who attended and added their own personal story. We, might, we were moved by their bravery in coming to this place and sharing what is still a much misunderstood and stigmatised mental health issue. 
At a clinical level, there have been steps forward in ensuring that GPs have the necessary information to deal with the presentation. And as I pointed out in a previous uh, debate, a managed clinical network for eating disorders has been operational since eight, uh, 2005, covering Grampian, Tayside, Highland, Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. However, as Dennis Robertson has pointed out in the motion, there can still be complications in the clinical pathway that can be very discouraging for people who are suffering. We must continually reinforce the message that this is a serious mental health problem, and when people present, they do so during one of the most difficult periods of their lives. They cannot be turned away and left to retreat back into themselves. Instead, the process of presentation must be made as unintimidating as possible, and that starts with an understanding GP who can make a quick and accurate assessment and communicate with families. And again, Dennis Robertson emphasised the importance of that today. As is the case every year, a number of charities have put their best foot forward to raise awareness of eating disorders across Scotland and the UK, none more so than BEAT, who in their 25th year are hosting Socket to Eating Disorders. This yearly event encourages supporters to get silly with their socks and wear colourful, wacky socks for the day and donate one pound to BEAT. This is a light-hearted and highly visual campaign that helps to bring public attention to Awareness Week. However, as BEAT's website highlights, the inspiration for the campaign has a very sad story behind it. I haven't got time to recount that story today, but you can see, read it on the website. ISD um, um, has, publishes up-to-date statistics on the number of presentations and referrals for eating disorders in Scotland. Figures for 2013 show that those who presented to either a GP or practised employed nurse with an eating disorder are for the majority 15 to 24-year-old females. This is a trend that has been continuing for many years, <coughs> although as I stated in a previous debate, the number of presentations by young men has gone up recently. UK figures presided by NICE suggest that 1.6 million people in the UK are affected by an eating disorder, of which around 11% are male. But what is most striking is this, uh, this is a mental health problem consistently associated with a younger age demographic. Policymakers must acknowledge this when targeting their interventions. A study by BEAT, whose awareness campaign I mentioned earlier, was published on Monday of this week, making the case for a more preventative approach. The in-depth report, Eating Disorders, A Price Too High to Pay, received 517 survey responses from individuals and carers affected by eating disorders. It identified a need to dramatically increase resources for earlier intervention and indicated how inconsistent access to treatment can, can be for individuals, leading to a cost to the economy of tens of billions of pounds. And again, Dennis Robertson emphasised that. However, successfully identifying eating problems as soon as behaviour changes are noticed will help to prevent damaging behaviours from worsening over time and becoming more costly to treat. Respondents to the survey indicated that symptoms of eating disorders are first recognised under the age of 16 in 62 per cent of cases. This is an important statistic as it means the cycle of treatment, recovery and relapse can cause severe disruption to sufferers' education, impacting on their employment, professional development and lifetime earnings. The effects can last a lifetime and come at a high cost to not only immediate family but wider society. However, early detection can help. Those respondents who sought support at an earlier stage cited a relapse rate of only 33% compared to an average level of 63% for all those who presented later in their illness. Presiding officer, in conclusion, what this report highlights and what the motion before us today points out is that we could be doing better with more targeted early interventions and clear pathways of support for GPs, individuals and carers. At present, the picture before us is still one of a fractured and inconsistent provision. When the cost of the individual and to society is so incredibly high, this is an area that needs prioritisation. On this Awareness Week, let's join together in recognising the bravery of those who make their voices heard and the hard-working charities that give them support. Let's also look to make the improvements necessary to ensure that fewer people suffer each year that we debate this most important issue in the Chamber. Thank you once again to Dennis Robertson for the debate today and all the work that he has done uh, over uh, the period of this Parliament on this most important issue. Thank you. And I now call Christian Allard to be followed by Nanette Milne. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, as a good friend of Dennis Robertson, uh, I would like to say something he's not very good at, is to blow his own trumpet. So I might use part of my contribution today to do exactly that. And I know Malcolm Chisholm did a little bit of that at the end of his contribution. Because it's important, it's, too, it's important to realize uh, what Dennis has done the last four years. Uh, as 
myself, the man behind the man behind the dog, uh, for many years, I, I was in a privileged position uh, to see, to witness how much Dennis uh, has done uh, as a father and as a member of Aberdeenshire West, how much he's, uh, he has achieved uh, over the years. Uh, it, it was four years ago, and, and I remember it vividly, and we talked about it uh, in previous debate, and I was, uh, I was contributing to the debate last year. And what I said about it is all the little step that Dennis took uh, after the event, uh, starting with my own academy in West Hill, is a secondary school, where uh, he spoke to, to parents and he spoke to teachers, and he really opened it up and make it that awareness so important at schools. That's what followed up uh, with a conference, the first conference in Aberdeenshire in, uh, in a Port Leighton Schools Academy, where really that was a meeting of mine for uh, a lot of the teachers and try to progress uh, this awareness, not among the teachers, but among the students as well. And thereafter, the opening of the first NHS inpatient eating disorder unit uh, at NHS Grampian, and we had the privilege, I had the privilege to meet uh, some of the NHS staff, and I've got to say, uh, not only they are fantastic and they're inspiring, but they recognize Dennis Robertson as uh, the leading figure uh, in, in, in the fight uh, against uh, this uh, absolute disease. And particularly, I love to say that NHS Grampian and the staff as a hidden unit are, are quite good at, at understanding the, the problem of patients at a different age. And I was quite pleased to notice, and I would like to go and visit. I did not have the pleasure to go and visit yet, and I did promise I would go. Uh, we've got a video uh, therapy unit which is quite interesting because it will help to, uh, to have a direct uh, uh, access uh, to care and, and to clinic. And sometimes we know that this kind of disorder, uh, you need to tackle them at the right time. And we've got to make sure that uh, the services uh, are ready to act. And I, I was delighted to see that uh, this video therapy clinic uh, works all across the region from Banff, Elgin, Fraserborough, uh, Stony and Shetland, and uh, Peterhead, Tariff, and, and Shetland. Even. Mr. Allard, give way. Yes, of course. Kevin Stewart. I thank Mr. Allard for giving way, presiding officer. Um, one of the things uh, about uh, this job and every other is that I think if you don't learn something new every day, then you're probably failing in your duty. Uh, would Mr. Allard agree with me that uh, the education that uh, Mr. Robertson has helped uh, provide to us as members uh, has been uh, immense in terms of moving forward in tackling eating disorders? Christian Allard. Yes, and thank you very much to notice because, it's, again, it's a praise we have to, to, to direct to, to, to Dennis. When, I, when Dennis said that he had no idea uh, what is it is realized is we had no idea, and most of us had absolutely no idea before uh, Dennis Robertson brought it to, to this chamber. And he was honest enough to say he had no idea. And what I would like to finish on this, presenting officer, it's families have no idea. We can't, uh, as a father, Dennis Robertson, or us, as a, me as a friend of the family, I had no idea. Uh, what uh, patients are going through. And we have to accept that fact, that people who are not suffering from this illness have no idea. So we have to see that help and support to families, to friends, to relatives, have to be tailor-made to make them understand from day one that we have no idea. And we need to let the process and the clinician uh, uh, going through uh, what uh, they need to do best. So, uh, uh, in conclusion, I would like to, uh, to say again how much admiration Dennis Robertson has in this field. And I spoke to Jacqueline Lucera, which we, both of them we're going to hear tonight, uh, and uh, they told me about the great admiration we have for Dennis Robertson. Presenting officer. Thank you. I now call Nanette Millen to be followed by Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I first apologise to the Chamber, as I'll have to leave b before the end of the debate because of other commitments, and for the same reason, I'll be unable to attend the Eating Disorders Seminar this evening. Um, 
I'd also like to add my congratulations to Dennis Robertson for once again bringing this very serious issue to the Chamber. This debate, which focuses on the prevalence of eating disorders and the serious long-term health conditions which can be associated with them, is the latest in the line of what has become an annual event. And I'd like to think that as we go forward, awareness of the condition will continue to improve, as it has done in recent years. Many people don't associate eating disorders with conditions like osteoporosis, type 1 diabetes, organ failure and other mental health conditions, and I commend Dennis Robertson for highlighting this in his motion. The motion rightly emphasises the worrying figures from NHS ISD regarding the number of people in Scotland who ask for medical help or treatment each year. A significant number, but one which almost certainly masks the so far unidentified people who have one of the disorders, but for a variety of reasons do not seek help. I was aware through previous Eating Disorder Awareness Weeks that this has been a very successful campaign right across the UK involving universities, charities, schools, health professionals, local authorities, those affected by eating disorders and individual carers. What I was not fully aware of was the extent to which Eating Disorders Awareness Week stretches across the globe, with many states in America participating and also groups in Canada, Australia, Europe and so forth. Perhaps our work as politicians and our participation in debates such as this will assist in seeing an extension of involvement in other areas of the world, thereby spreading the awareness of eating disorders to populations not yet aware of them. Presiding officer, in previous debates, I've focused on students moving away from home to an unfamiliar environment, one of the consequences of which can be depression leading to conditions such as anorexia. In another debate, we looked at the influence supermodels can have on girls, particularly teenagers, who feel the need to aspire to such levels of so-called beauty. Again, this can develop into complex emotions of inferiority, manifesting themselves in eating disorders such as bulimia and anorexia nervosa. In the time available to me, I'd like to look at another aspect of eating disorders which perhaps does not receive the coverage it deserves, and that concerns the number of men who are affected. Between 10 and 25% of people in the UK experiencing eating disorders are male, and the majority of men who have eating disorders struggle to get access to appropriate support and treatment. Therefore, it's particularly difficult to know how many men are actually affected by the conditions. Often, as with females similarly affected, it's to achieve the body perfect, as displayed by footballers and athletes. Persistent use of gyms, not for fun or sport, but to obtain that perfection and slimming to dangerous lengths can eventually lead to life-threatening conditions. Only this week's week, statistics in Ireland showed a 30% rise in calls to eating disorder helplines, which included boys and young men. Thankfully, there is support for males affected by eating disorders through organisations such as Men and Boys Eating and Exercise Disorders Service, which does tremendous support work across Scotland and has bases in my regional cities of Dundee and Aberdeen. One of this organisation's key messages is to make people understand that an eating disorder is a mental health condition, and it also aims to remove the stigma that only women and girls are affected. I know there are many people, particularly parents, who through ignorance or denial do believe that it's a female-centric condition. Presiding officer, I would like to end by making a brief comment about eating disorders in men of middle age or later. Although our political persuasions are miles apart, I thought it was extremely brave of John Prescott when he announced some years ago that he had suffered from bulimia for over 10 years. For a bluff bruiser like him, it must have taken a great deal of courage for him to come forward to help end the stigma of eating disorders, and I admire him for it. As he said at the time, I want to say to the millions of people affected, do take advice, it can help, and it can help you out of a lot of misery that you suffer in silence. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, before we move on, could I just advise the Chamber that given the number of members who still wish to speak in this debate, I'm minded to accept a motion from Dennis Robertson under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Mr Robertson? Yes, thank you. So moved. Thank you. Is Parliament agreed? We are. I now call Jim Hume to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, members. Of course, I congratulate Dennis Robertson on again bringing this debate to the Chamber and recognise the strength of him in doing so, uh, something that we all ad admire. Eating disorders recognised by the medical community as mental health issues are equally as important 
for the physical health of the individual as, as uh, for their mental and uh, psychological health. Numbers show that eating disorders are more prevalent among young people, and especially girls of up to 24 years of age, with uh, 15 to 24-year-olds most exposed to the pressures that lead to uh, eating disorders. Members, we're facing a crisis, I think, among our youth population, which is twofold. On one hand, what is often seen as societal pressures affecting young people's thinking into dis dissatisfaction with their physical appearance leads to extreme measures and healthy lifestyles and mounting health problems. As we know, this doesn't just affect physical appearance, but causes an obsession over one's own image and slowly de deteriorates young people's healthy state of mind. Approximately 2,000 people yearly seek treatment for an eating disorder. This number accounts only for the people who are seeking help and treatment. There lies an unknown number of yet more people, youth in the majority, uh, who have not reported their condition to a cl close person or a health practitioner. Their issues affect us all. As a Scottish society, we're always seeking to improve. We can't leave behind our youth succumbing to the pressures of unrealistic body shapes who, faced with a lack of adequate mental support, seek to take issues into their own hands by harming their physical well-being. So what is our role and, and the role of the government in providing support for young girls and boys who hold these perceptions of body shapes? How can we expect healthy, motivated and engaged individuals if we don't do enough to provide our support? Not when we realise that someone is suffering from anorexia, but to prevent anorexia from ever happening in the first place. So we need to take a firm stand to make children, teenagers and young adults understand that shape doesn't matter. What matters is a healthy body and a healthy mind and show that we're ready and capable as a country of guiding anyone who might be suffering to take the right steps and avoid falling into that spiral of eating disorders. Unfortunately, eating disorders, just like so many other conditions, can spiral into a host of other conditions and diseases. Yes, of course. Dan Robertson. I thank the member for taking a brief intervention. I recently heard a quote, and that was to say that those who attribute anorexia nervosa to an eating disorder is like attributing lung cancer to a cough. Does the member agree that we should actually uh, move away from the term eating disorder and actually state what it actually is, a mental illness? Jim, you. Well, yes, I, I, I couldn't uh, agree with... Uh, Dennis Robertson, more, uh, more than that, I'm quite happy to take that on board. Thank you for that. So uh, I think we have to look at f further pressures on mental health and psychological uh, well-being. Uh, can, osteoporosis can happen, uh, anemia and organ failure can and do occur. I, th I think we want to make it clear that it has to be, we have to be able to stand by those who need our support. And I think we've also got to enable the availability and flexibility of the most appropriate and necessary resources of our healthcare system to reach those who are in need the most. Both children and adolescent uh, mental health officers on the side of mental support as well as nutritionists, nurses and GPs on the side of physical support should be empowered to address these issues uh, before they have to address additional or more serious issues as, as a result. As this chamber knows, it's been a, a personal pr priority to increase the focus on mental health services for young children and uh, and ed adolescents. I think it's a further commitment that I will seek to work with the relevant bodies and the government to prevent and protect people from resorting to such uh, issues as the eating disorders that we're talking about. I'm sure support for this action will be cross-party and cement our commitment to improving the mental and physical health of all of those that we've been talking about tonight. I would like to again thank Dennis Robertson for bringing this debate into the chamber again and for keeping uh, the awareness of eating disorders top of the agenda. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too want to congratulate Dennis Robertson for securing the debate and also, like others in the Chamber, pay tribute to his courage for pursuing the issue. Presiding Officer, conditions that make somebody damage themselves are probably the hardest for us to comprehend. What would make someone fight every instinct and damage or even kill themselves while doing so? It's clear that cutting what you eat to the extreme takes a great deal of self-control. 
Therefore, it is often associated with people who feel that they have lost control of their own lives. It is also prevalent in young people whose lives change quickly and uncontrollably during puberty and indeed in growing up. And surely that signals that young people are naturally more at risk. And you can see how this loss of control would also be a an attribute of developing type 1 diabetes. That these extreme eating disorders are difficult to understand shows that they will be difficult to treat because the sufferers have already overcome their natural instinct to protect and nourish themselves. There needs to be more understanding of the causes as well as better research into treatments. There are very few specialist centres, meaning people don't receive the treatment they require. There also appears to be an ignorance within the health service as to how they should be treated in the first place. In extreme situations, force feeding might be seen as life-saving, and you can see that that would be instinctive. However, unless you deal with the cause, you're at risk of creating an even more greater aversion to eating by forcing someone to eat against their will. We need to have much more dedicated mental health services for young people with eating disorders, and indeed dedicated services for those who would self-harm as well, something that we're missing. We need to understand these conditions and put in early intervention to help sufferers. It's so sad that young people tend to have to leave home, loved ones, and travel some very great distances to access quality care. And I think that needs to change because at a time in their lives when young people are vulnerable, they need to be close to their family and friends. We also need to look at the care pathway. I recently spoke to a group of young people, um, who, a, a group of people called Speak, who talked to me about how they accessed help for mental illness and disorders. And they told me that their first line of support was often their guidance teacher at school. And this was sometimes very hit and miss, depending on the person who was providing that support. They also told me that there was often no private space for them to make that first approach to get help. Guidance teachers were also often in charge of detention and indeed had to deal with people for bad behaviour, making the setting and indeed the system very difficult for them to access. There is also often a long waiting time for professional help and the target is 18 weeks, but 18 weeks for a young person is an eternity at a time when their brains are still forming and life, their life chances are being built. Those four months or so can change the direction of their whole lives. In order to help them receive help early, we also need to speak about these conditions and deal with stigma. Mental health conditions continue to be stigmatised and this appears to be stubbornly hard to deal with. And unless we have those open discussions, we won't deal with stigma at all. Presiding officer, finally, um, as other people have said, we also need to deal with the pressure to attain unrealistically thin bodies, digitally altering images of extremely thin models in the first place to make them even taller and thinner, portrays bodies that are impossible to attain. And this is then portrayed as perfection and something that we should all aspire to. We need to stop this and be realistic about what is normal. Deciding officer, indeed, we need to celebrate the whole spectrum of what is normal. Thank you very much. And I now call Mark MacDonald. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, can I congratulate my colleague Dennis Robertson on bringing this debate to the chamber? Uh, Dennis has uh, brought a number of debates on this very important issue to the Chamber, which uh, obviously, as he's highlighted on every occasion, is something which has affected him quite profoundly. Uh, and I think it is a great testament to Dennis the huge amount of awareness that now exists within this Chamber uh, and within wider society around issues uh, relating to eating disorders and uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, mental health uh, aspects uh, in, in relation to that. I want to focus my comments uh, around the issues uh, of um, diabetes uh, and eating disorders. I, I spoke uh, with the, um, the, the individuals at the Diabe Diabetics with Eating Disorder stall uh, earlier on today. Um, and one of the issues that was raised uh, during my discussion was that um, it, it, it's not enough to just uh, focus on the issue around educating individuals on uh, use of insulin because 
you're dealing with people who know exactly how to use their insulin and not just how to use it, but how to manipulate it uh, in order to uh, affect uh, their, their, um, their weight uh, as a consequence of that. And I want to talk about a constituent of mine, Emma, uh, who I first met during my by-election campaign in 2013. Uh, and Emma identified as a, a diabolemic. Uh, and diabolemia is a, a term uh, created to represent uh, diabetic bulimia. Uh, the condition occurs when insulin-dependent diabetics skip injection uh, in order to lose weight. Uh, and this type of disorder usually affects type 1 diabetics. Um, young diabetics who already have numerous issues to deal with um, can uh, realise potential weight loss by skipping insulin, but they don't often understand how they are damaging their bodies as a result. And um, Emma herself had been admitted to hospital on multiple occasions for uh, diabetic uh, ketoacidosis, or DKA, uh, and her feeling was that at the time uh, this perhaps should have uh, sounded alarm bells and should have led to a deeper understanding of the condition that affected her. And so after a meeting with Emma and then returning to Parliament following the by-election, I put down a parliamentary question uh, on the issue uh, of diabolemia. I asked the Scottish Government what guidance it had issued to NHS boards in respect of the diagnosis and treatment of diabolemia. Uh, the reply from the Minister, Michael Matheson, said in 2006 guidance was issued to NHS boards on the management and, treat and treatment of eating disorders in Scotland. While diabolemia is not specifically included, we expect principles and good practice around care and treatment of individuals will be applicable to this cohort of people. And I, I, I would say to, to, to the Minister that this is maybe something that merits some examination. I'm aware from the conversation I had at the Diabetics with Eating Disorders stall that um, there is now some progress in terms of inclusion within the DSM-5, in terms of uh, the list of identified mental health conditions, um, but that chronic insulin um, deprivation or, 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 or failure to take insulin has not yet been readily identified in its own right. And there was a, a, an issue raised with me about the cohesion between physical and mental health. We often talk about uh, the parity between physical and mental health, and that is absolutely vital. But there's an element of cohesion when it comes to diabetics with eating disorders, because where you have uh, the physical health of the individual being looked at, but not necessarily the mental health, and vice versa, uh, it means that potentially um, those dealing with uh, diabetics with eating disorders are not treating the individual in a cohesive and holistic fashion. So I would ask the Minister to maybe have a look at that and see whether there needs to be some update to the guidance or uh, some further guidance in relation specifically to eating disorders as they affect diabetics, um, because I think that would be uh, very welcome, certainly from my constituent, Emma, and I suspect from other diabetics who are affected by eating disorders. Many thanks, and I now invite Jamie Hepburn to respond to the debate. Minister, around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Robson. Can I <coughs> begin by joining with other members to congratulate Dennis uh, Robertson on uh, securing uh, this uh, debate? I think we all uh, know of uh, Dennis Robertson's personal uh, interest in this uh, matter, and I want to thank him for uh, his uh, uh, personal uh, testimony, which I, I know must uh, be very difficult for him to come to the chamber and provide us with uh, Malcolm Chisholm described uh, Dennis as a, a brave voice, and I certainly would uh, concur uh, with uh, uh, that. I know he's uh, campaigned assiduously uh, on behalf of uh, people uh, with uh, an eating uh, disorder. Uh, and as Mark MacDonald uh, said, he's, he's raised this issue uh, in part on a, a number uh, of occasions. I think it's very important that we, as a, a legislature, are uh, seen to be uh, debating uh, this uh, issue uh, regularly, not least in terms of uh, raising our own awareness uh, about this. I think both Mark McDonald and Christian Allard uh, made the point about how uh, better informed they and all of us have, all of us have been uh, by the work that Dennis Robertson uh, has uh, engaged in. Uh, so as we uh, mark uh, this year's uh, Eating Disorder uh, Week, it is uh, right that we recognise the efforts of uh, all the people and organisations across the country uh, working to raise awareness of uh, eating uh, disorders. I'd like to uh, pay tribute to the dedication and continuing work of all the professional staff and volunteers across all uh, sectors, and particularly uh, to those people living 
with an eating disorder uh, and their carers and uh, families and their efforts to uh, tackle uh, this uh, serious and potentially life-threatening uh, uh, illness. Uh, I have uh, listened very carefully to uh, the range of uh, comments and issues uh, raised uh, during the uh, debate, and uh, I will try and pick up uh, a number of them uh, as uh, I go uh, through uh, my own uh, uh, contribution. But I certainly would want to reassure uh, members of the Government's commitment to uh, the, uh, ensuring that we uh, are uh, improving care uh, services and support for uh, those uh, who uh, have an eating di uh, uh, disorder. Uh, Dennis Robertson raised uh, the importance of uh, treatment in the community. And of course, it is important to recognise the vast majority of people with eating disorders will be treated uh, in uh, the community with uh, support provided uh, by primary care or uh, community mental health uh, uh, teams. Uh, I should, of course, say all NHS boards keep arrangements and services uh, under review and uh, are working towards uh, improved access and outcomes for service users and their families based on prevention, uh, appropriate intervention and uh, sustained uh, recovery. And Nanette Mullen, who I know uh, ha has uh, left, she couldn't stay for the entire debate, but she uh, raised concern about people uh, not uh, accessing uh, services. I would uh, say that national guidance and recommendations uh, for the management and treatment of eating disorders in Scotland were uh, published in 2006. Mr Macdonald referred to uh, that uh, 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 guidance. Uh, the guidance covers the uh, general principles, role of the GP and primary care team, specialist services, uh, dietitian training uh, and awareness raising uh, for staff. And we would expect the NHS boards and their uh, parts to take account of this against another uh, uh, guidance in, in the management and uh, organisation of eating disorder services uh, across uh, Scotland. I, I should also say, uh, President Officer, we uh, are driving our improvement agenda forward through the delivery of the National Mental Health and Suicide uh, Preventing Strategies. These strategies combine to deliver a range of commitments which will impact positively on improving uh, care, services and support for those with an eating disorder and their uh, families. Uh, Malcolm uh, uh, Chisholm uh, rightly emphasised that this is a, an important uh, mental uh, health uh, issue and the Scottish Government uh, views it as such. Uh, and as the First Nation in uh, the UK to introduce a target to ensure faster access to uh, psychological therapies for all ages, uh, this recognises the positive contribution such therapies uh, can make to treating a uh, mental illness and in particular uh, eating uh, disorders. The target for NHS boards is that patients get a referral to treatment for psychological therapies within 18 weeks. The latest data shows that the uh, average adjusted uh, waiting time is eight weeks and 81.4 per cent of people were seen within 18 weeks. And of course, we're working to ensure uh, that figure is higher. And that target complements our priority attention to proving the mental health of children and young people in the 18-week uh, target set for referral to specialist child and adolescent mental health services. The latest data shows 78.9 per cent of people seen with 18 weeks, which again is not uh, high enough, but we are uh, moving in the right direction and we do have an average waiting time of uh, seven weeks. Uh, of course. Tens Robertson. I, I appreciate what the Minister has said. Is the Minister able to advise us uh, with reference to these figures um, uh, in terms of those that are presenting with eating disorders uh, that are being seen and seen appropriately? And you refer to the 2006 guidance. Minister, several, several young people have died. And I would suggest that the implementation of this guidance is not universal. Minister? Well, of course, we would uh, certainly expect that uh, any guidance we issue is uh, taken very seriously indeed uh, in, uh, by all health boards uh, across the country. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, priority that we are uh, giving to uh, improving access to uh, CAM services, because I, I recognise this will be important uh, for those uh, with uh, eating disorders, uh, this is an area that we have absolutely uh, prioritised. We have uh, invested uh, nearly £17 million pounds since uh, 2009 in uh, these services. And we have seen uh, workforce uh, increase by 24%. Uh, percent. And we have seen uh, some 60% uh, percent, uh, 60 percent increase in the number of children and young people uh, seen by services over the last two years. I do not have the exact figures in front of me, but I know that uh, a number of... The, uh, yes, indeed. Kevin Stewart. Uh, I thank the Minister for giving way. I recognise that things are improving, but there are still difficulties in certain areas, including in NHS Grampian. Uh, I wrote to the Chief Executive of NHS Grampian today and copied that to the Minister, because I have some concerns about them failing. 
uh, to deal with things appropriately. I wonder if the Minister could comment on what he intends to do in those areas that are not achieving the targets that are set. Minister? Well, of course, uh, I have uh, received uh, that uh, correspondence and I will be responding in due course to Mr Stewart. I would recognise uh, that there are some areas which are not performing as well as others. I have instructed my office uh, earlier today in advance of Mr Stewart having uh, written to me, in fact, uh, that I will be wanting to speak to uh, all the chief executives of those areas that are uh, posing a particular uh, issue in terms of uh, access to CAM services, and I will be having uh, a discussion with uh, those chief executives uh, as soon as, as possible. But the point I was going to uh, make is that we have seen a dramatic increase in the numbers <coughs> uh, uh, being seen by CAM services, which is in itself uh, a good thing. It is a, a sign that stigmatisation is uh, reducing and more people are willing uh, to come uh, forward. Uh, I see I'm uh, running low on time, uh, President Officer. Let me uh, just comment uh, on uh, at least a few uh, other areas. I was very pleased to see uh, the recent formation of the Scottish Child and Adolescent Mental Health Eating Disorder Group to uh, help promote service uh, development training and share innovative uh, practice for children uh, and young people with eating disorders uh, across Scotland. We will look to learn uh, from that work and where further improvements are found to be necessary, we will seek uh, to uh, uh, act. Uh, and indeed, uh, I want to also uh, focus on relation to, uh, in particular, the issue of uh, the uh, prevalence of those with an eating disorder who also have a diagnosis of diabetes. I will be attending the parliamentary reception uh, after uh, this uh, debate and I look forward to uh, learning uh, more uh, there. What I would uh, say, of course, is that this uh, government has uh, published a, a diabetes improvement a plan published in, in November uh, of last year, which sets out a range of actions to support people uh, living with diabetes. Actions within the plan include a focus on prevention of complications, improving glycemic control, uh, crucially reducing uh, disengagement from services and improving outcomes for disadvantaged and minority groups. And picking up Mark McDonald's very important point, uh, uh, I should say that through the Scottish Diabetes Group, we did uh, fund uh, the psychology and diabetes uh, uh, pilot project uh, which uh, has now uh, concluded, and we expect uh, the lessons learnt from this uh, to be shared appropriately across health boards in Scotland, uh, and work is ongoing uh, to consider how best to uh, dissemin disseminate the learning and outcomes of this pilot, and if it is appropriate to update our guidance uh, accordingly, then of course we will uh, seek uh, to do so. I could, of course, say uh, much more. I see I am well over uh, time, so I will not do that, uh, President Officer, but can I uh, say uh, Dennis Robertson made the point that things have uh, got uh, better, but I, I uh, would uh, suggest that we can always uh, look to get uh, better still in relation to uh, ensuring we are doing all we can to support those with uh, an eating disorder. Uh, and I will uh, make that commitment to uh, taking forward that work in my ministerial office. And can I conclude by once again thanking Dennis Robertson for bringing forward this motion for debate. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes Dennis Robertson's debate on Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2015. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.